Control C. Hello, everybody. My name is Della Lost and today we're doing a reaction video. Anyways, we're getting to the shit, but we're going on. So I have to wait for the fucking ads to get done playing because, bitch, I don't watch the nose. But um, this is going to be for Tail Foundry. Um, the name of this video is going to be. God damn it. Just give me a second so I can click out of here, please. Thank you. Anyways, this is for um, why Cosmic Horror isn't scary. <laughs> Anyways, let's begin. Strangers to some good old cosmic horror. Yes. We love our eldritch space entities, our seas writhing with untold monstrosities, mm -hmm. our horrific and forgotten origin stories. It's always fun to stare the ineffable in the face and grapple with our own cosmically minuscule scale, if even just for a moment. Yeah. There aren't many other genres out there that can make you feel so much like an ant on the pavement, a mode of dust on the wind. It's a unique, almost devastating brand of horror. And yet, every time we make a video about it, mm -hmm. we get comments from people just saying outright that it's, it's not even scary. scary. Which has always felt weird to me, given the gravity of the material. I mean, this is a genre that wants to upend your entire concept of self, if not your reality. And you somehow find that less scary than this? <laughs> My first impulse is, of course, just to argue the point. Because surely, if they really understood why it was scary, it would be scary to them. Yeah. But... You know, I don't think that's it. Well, here's the thing, right? Cosmic horror is only scary if you don't understand it. And we already understand what it is, so it's no longer scary. It's also the fact that just cosmic horror in general tends to be one of the things where it's like, well, shit, we've seen enough fucked up weird creatures all throughout history, things, and we've also had our own fucking events of history recently, which are just more fucked up than anything that these monsters could ever do. So, why in the world would I be afraid of that? Shit. I fear my local politician more than I feel I fear Cthulhu. In fact, the more I think about it, the more that sort of indifference really starts to make sense. Yeah. In fact, I think there's even a point at which Cosmic Horror might go so far beyond scary that it loops back around and becomes almost blissful. <laughs> yeah. Like, for example, there, I, I got two examples of what I say perfect heaven for me is. Um, by the way, I pause a lot. I'm going to do that all throughout this. There's not going to be a point where I go, oh, let's let the video play. No, 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 no. This is a reaction video. I get to talk as much as I fucking please. But there's a lot of times where I'll just look at things and go, hmm, perfect heaven is either one, being surrounded by all the people I know in perfect harmony. Or two, an emptyless, vacuumless, black void in which I can let my brain just rot. Where nothing exists. Not even time. No space. Nothing. And then I also have, the, you know, nice everyone's there with me type of shit. So, like, there's two different ways you can find comfort. So I can definitely understand that. And then we get this fucking amazing intro. God damn, it's amazing. Mm, dun, 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 dun. Having trouble writing? Well, there's a 14 part video series you can watch for free that I think will really The link help. will be in the description. It certainly helped me. The Creative Writing Bootcamp, taught by best selling author Myla Goldberg. Check the description to see how you can get access to it and change how you think about writing forever without spending a dime. A big thanks to Skillshare for sponsoring this video and giving us the opportunity to tell you about it. This mm -hmm. class has been a special one for me. And I've there's a story called The Nameless City by H.P. Lovecraft. I'm going to be honest with you, I just hit the little skip button for a fraction of a second because I knew we didn't have to have worry about it. But yeah, I'm going to put the description to the Skillshare link thing in the description of this video as well so that you can just take your ass over there and still give them their fucking, you know, their, their money. Anyways, support Tale of Foundry. They're just really good. They make educational content that's entertaining, but maintains a sense of style and cohesiveness. It's just fucking good. That does a really great job illustrating how Cosmic Core works. In fact, we pretty much made a whole video about it last year, but hmm. the short version is this. An explorer finds it this way. Oh, God. Lag. Please, no. Enabled city so old, its name has been lost to time. Hopefully it didn't lag for the stream goes, itself. The stranger it gets. Architecture unfit for humans, 
glass coffins with unspeakably strange corpses inside. And finally, in the darkest, deepest reaches of the place, a radiant white boy that calls out to him from within a great door. He's drawn toward it as if by a strong wind. And just hmm. before he's pulled inside, just as he begins to make out the grotesque faces of the unnameable creatures beyond, mm -hmm. the door slams shut, and he is plunged blessedly back into darkness. I like this example a lot because it doesn't really hide behind a monster. Yes, there are technically monsters within the Radiant Void, mm -hmm, but the mm -hmm. description is kind of just a malevolent jumble of words, impossible to really fathom or make sense of. If there were more of a discreet monster, like Cthulhu or the Elder Things, it would be easy to mistake the threat they pose to your life as the source of the horror. And yeah. yes, I suppose the threat of death is indeed very existential, but it's also obvious. The Nameless City forces us to focus on the deeper elements of cosmic horror, the ways in which it threatens your sanity and your self-concept. The explorer of the Nameless City says of his experience, I must always remember and shiver in the night wind until oblivion, or worse, claims mm -hmm. me. Monstrous, unnatural, colossal was the thing. Too far beyond the ideas of man to be believed, except in the silent, damnable small hours when one cannot sleep. What the Even fuck? he questions what he experienced, barely able to believe it except when in a dreamy, delirious half-slumber. After an experience like that, how could you ever quite trust your senses again? Wouldn't you have a strange feeling that everything might be a little untrue, less real? Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. even if you were able to accept it, what would this revelation imply about your place in the cosmos? You are the nothing. Fact that there are terrible truths you will never understand. Biblical and angels. Dark places created by intelligences who roamed the earth the ages before man ever came gasping from the sea. It's enough to make you feel like a hapless grain of sand. In the desert of deep time. Maybe. Or maybe it just doesn't feel like much at all. Maybe. To Again, I, I'm perfectly fine with just being nothingness. You, this story is tantamount to a spelunker finding a weird thing in a cave and way overreacting to it. Nah. Maybe the revelation of the nameless city and its radiant void just don't really mean anything to you. And you have to wonder how people really manage to find a story like this scary. If that's the case, I really can't blame you, because I think there's something going on beneath the surface here, and it really does work on different people in different ways. Mm -hmm. To me, this isn't actually about cosmic horror at all. It's about the thing that ultimately makes cosmic horror work. That unspeakable, ineffable, glorious, world-shatteringly massive something that manages to obliterate your sanity and your self-concept. <laughs> in a word, the sublime. What? That might sound a little strange to you. I've heard the word sublime before, but at the same time, I have no idea what the fuck the actual definition is. By today's so, standards, hit me. The way you've probably heard sublime used was just to describe something exceedingly good. Mm -hmm. The meal was sublime, you might hear someone say. Or, this view is simply sublime. But yeah, I've heard that one actually. There's a long history of philosophical thought behind it. It's definitely more than just an adjective. A lot more, actually. It's kind of... Hard to grasp. How can I put this simply? Imagine this. You're on a small boat in the mm -hmm. middle of the ocean. Everywhere you look, in every direction, nothing but waves laughing at the horizon. You don't know exactly how deep the water reaches beneath you, but it might yes. as well be an endless void from where you are, staring at its gently rolling surface. On this sliver of placid gravity between the endlessly open sky and the endlessly yawning water Fucking beneath hell. you, the sense is one of overwhelming vastness. You have no choice but to notice just how small you are. It's always somewhere in the back of your mind. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Traveling out to sea is both a pleasure and a risk. But you knew that. That's part of what makes it worth doing. Yeah. So here you are, tiny in the vastness of the sea. And then, out of nowhere, as you're admiring the view, a black figure rises up out of the sea beside you. Oh, fuck no. The sun, Casting its great shadow over you. No, not Cthulhu, not Dagon. A it's a whale. whale. A real living creature larger than any other you've seen in your life. And it's just 30 meters away. Here, in this moment, heart pounding in your chest, 
boat rocking on the disturbed surface of the water. You feel yourself caught between two extremes. Your brain registers immediately that you might die here, that this creature mm -hmm. could end your entire life without even noticing, just by surfacing in the wrong place. At the same time, so close to this impossibly large thing, close enough that you can feel the salt spray of its breach on your face, you somehow feel more alive than ever. That is the experience of the sublime. Mm -hmm. At least, that's how the 18th century philosopher Edmund Burke used the term. To him, the word meant greatness. It did not, however, mean beauty. In Ooh. fact, in his writing, he associates it far more with terror than anything else. He says, When danger or pain press too nearly, they are incapable of giving any delight and are simply terrible. But at certain distances, and with certain modifications, they may be, and they are, beautiful. As we every day experience, you know the way. I'm gonna be honest with you. That actually is fucking okay. So normally I would be like, oh, I don't know about that, right? Like that's kind of weird. But at the same time, it's the lighting. It's the way that the tentacles pierce through the shattered glass and all of the different broken beams that have been thrown about. This, this. Oh. It's also so nice. I almost feel like I could stare into the eye, or at least the main one, directly. Locked eyes with something that could stare into every orifice of mine, every hole, everything that I go, and probably stares through my soul and sees through the flesh behind me. But I don't care. I'm frozen solid and still because my mind has stopped moving. My blush. <laughs> I only can't even speak, really. I'm just staring into it. Well, I don't know what. It knows me. I know of it. And I'm too weak and too helpless to actually fight back against it. Anyways, that was my just take on trying to make some random ass shit. You know the whale is a horrific danger to you, that you would be powerless against the force it represents. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, being able to observe it in all its great vastness from your boat? What an incredible experience, like nothing else in the world. I find this interesting because it sort of paints a spectrum of emotions. On the one hand, we have terror. On the other, we have pleasure. And presumably, between the two, we have something unaffected and neutral. Yeah. We already get cosmic horror. That's the terror side of this. Mm -hmm. The whale could end your life without noticing it. You are a grain of sand in the desert of deep time. You are cosmically insignificant and unfit to fathom everything you see. Also, I have my own fucking way of just saying this. Okay, if I'm so small and insignificant, you're so big and so significant that you would matter nothing to me. Why should I consider you relevant? Why do I consider the one who is larger and more powerful than me relevant instead of myself? Does your mass and your greatness make me less? The fuck, no. That's one possible reaction to encountering the sublime. Then, toward the middle of our spectrum, you might feel not a sense of cosmic horror, but a sense of cosmic indifference. Yep. So what if you're that vulnerable to this massive sea creature? Yep. Why does the scale of your life against the scale of deep time even matter? Who said the cosmos has to care or that you have to understand it? When confronted with the sublime, it isn't unreasonable for your emotions to simply shut off. It might even be a good coping mechanism to prevent you from spiraling off into an existential episode. A way to acknowledge, but not succumb to, the sublime. And then we get to the far end of the spectrum. Beyond cosmic horror, beyond cosmic indifference, if you are lucky, you may have the opportunity to experience cosmic bliss. Get that shit out of my sight. No. Motherfucker really tried me. I'm fast as hell. We all know there about H.P. Lovecraft and his brand of horror. But while he was working on giving us nightmares, one of his friends was busy exploring a more hopeful side of this fiction. In the story The City of the Singing Flame by Clark Ashton Smith, the famous writer Giles Angar finds his way... 
Lovecraft had friends? Shit, that's hard to believe. ...into a realm unlike any on Earth. A place carpeted with violet grass, bathed Ooh. in the glow of a sunless amber sky, and permeated through with music. The music seems to glide on the air itself, beckoning to him. And of course, he follows. In a dreamlike trance, he wanders through a beautiful city of benevolent, statue-like giants, into a vast temple at the city's heart, and at last, to the song's mm -hmm. source, a fountain of radiant green flame suspended above a pit. And around it are gathered countless visitors like him, improbable creatures of every possible description, pilgrims mm -hmm. from who knows what strange dimensions. And also, I'm just loving that they're reusing some of the old creatures and things that they've had in other fucking videos. Because I see this in the goblins that they had. I'm seeing this from the video with the contract. Ooh. I wonder if I had watched some of the other videos without caught any other references. It's nice. Drawled by the music, many of them begin to hurl themselves into the fire. Angarth himself begins to feel the same compulsion and leaves before it can drive him to self-immolation. But before long, the allure of the flame and its beautiful song become too powerful in his mind. Mm -hmm. and he finds that he can think of little else. He can't even write fiction anymore, which is his entire career. So he returns, but decides to bring his illustrator friend with him this time. And when his friend, confronted by the beauty of the flame and its song, gives in to the compulsion and throws himself into the flame, Oh no! Engarth soon decides that he wishes for the same rapture. As he describes it, the flaming doom whose brief instant was better than eons of mortal life. He cannot return home, cannot even make his art anymore. He has witnessed the sublime, bewitching glory of the singing flame, and will only be satisfied when he, too, has joined it. If you think Jesus. that, this story is strikingly similar to the Nameless City. An explorer in a strange place finds himself face to face with the sublime. Both the radiant void of the Nameless City and the singing flame offer the same dangers. Mm -hmm. They both threaten the existence of anyone who enters them, the sanity of anyone who observes them, and the self-concept of anyone who experiences them. But, you'll notice, the framing is very different. Mm -hmm. In one of the stories, all of these are indeed interpreted as threats. But yes. in the other, they're interpreted almost as gifts. Instead Ooh. of existential dread at the prospect of ceasing to exist, the singing flame offers something almost merciful. Dissolution not as death, but as a release from this ongoing existential crisis called life. A beautiful, musical, <laughs> compassionate exit alongside so many others. It's probably a little hard to wrap your head around because, of course, you want to keep living. Human body. The green fire makes sense. I cannot guarantee I would not jump in. Biology screams against the idea of death, so it's weird to see it made even a little bit desirable. The book Annihilation by Jeff Vandermeer approaches this in a really interesting way. Mm -hmm. Early in the story, the main character inhales a spore from a strange fungus. As it grows oh, with air, it gradually shifts from being described as an infection to something far stranger. A sort of brightness gradually overtaking her. She can feel herself changing, the person she was gradually receding. And it feels good like a release from so many of her problems. Near the story's end, a dying character even describes her as, quote, a slow burning flame, a will-o'-the-wisp, floating across the marsh and the dunes, floating and floating, like nothing human, but something free and floating. What? Just like all those pilgrims in the temple, like Angarth's friend, like Angarth himself in the end, this woman is consumed, gone. And what? It's kind of wonderful for her. Instead of madness, the prospect of one's concept of reality being upended, the singing flame offers liberation from the confines of a hitherto limited and banal. Okay, so I'm definitely gonna have to fucking check in on that fucking fungus thing. What the fuck was that? It also gives me a ton of ideas to use for other shit, but I also need to find enough changes in weird ways so that I don't, I, I don't, I want to read the original so I don't fucking try to plagiarize that shit because fuck no. I, I refuse to fucking copy anyone else's work down. 
our existence. In the first book of the Angelarium series by Peter Morbacher, a man ascends into the abstracted heavenly realm of the divine where he confronts the world tree. It is all things. Every mm -hmm. piece of reality, every life that ever was, is contained within the lines of its bark, the twisting of its branches. Anxious about the earthly life he left behind, he tries to see the lives of his mortal family in the bark, but it's overwhelming yes. and he falls into despair. At this, Raziel, the angel of mysteries, says to him, do not seek to understand, simply stand witness. Just as the flame offers freedom from preconceptions of the value of life and individuality to Angarth, now this man, mm -hmm. standing amidst the divine, is offered the opportunity to let go and allow the truth to wash over him, whether he can make sense of it or not. I actually very much like this one. <laughs> okay, out of all the ones, um, the flame and this are probably my best endings. If I had to choose, obviously the whale is just you getting fucked up and you drown. Um, that, that, that just seems painful, drowning. Um, and obviously the white void just seems scary, you know? And I choose the green over anything, so that's nice. But at the same time, this one's a cool one because, you know, you just like accept everything. Acceptance is key. You are already dead. You're already alive. Accept both. And you will exist. At least that's my motto. Um, Instead of cosmic insignificance at the prospect of your tiny life against the immensity of all time and existence, the singing flame offers exaltation. The opportunity, if only for a beautiful transitory moment, to be part of the sublime, rather than just its observer. The story in the hills the also, the fungus one was also really fucking cool. The idea of proceeding to your own. Like, that. There's a lot of cool shit that's going on over there. I really want to ask more questions, but I wish I could. I'm going to have to research that on my own. But. Cities by Clive yeah. Barker is perhaps my favorite example of this in fiction. We even did an entire video on it last year. What? The short version is that, after discovering that an entire town of people has managed to turn itself into a wayward colossus of human bodies, mm. one of the main characters chases the giant down in a frenzy and climbs onto it to become a part of it. What? Although the giant is doomed to die, and there is no way this character will survive the journey, he feels he has no other choice. Quote, anything to catch this passing miracle and be a part of it. Better to go with it wherever it was going, serve its purpose, whatever that might be. Better to die with it, than live without it. Sounds really similar to what Angarth said, doesn't it? How, in the end, he longed for that flaming doom whose brief instant was better than eons of mortal life. So, the hell? if you're not afraid of cosmic horror, that's okay. You don't really have to be for it to be effective. Although the sublime is, as Burke said, fundamentally terrifying, that terror can also be the foundation for other powerful emotions. Maybe when you encounter these ineffable things larger than life. I literally made a fucking reaction video just now, didn't I? I literally just went on a rant about fuck them. Fuck the invincible creature that can't be dealt with. Fuck them. I will be me. Um, that was one of my reasons, and also just accepting you're fucked. <laughs> Um, I think my stances on this are already pretty obvious. Larger than your mind's ability to properly fathom, instead of responding with fear or pushing it out of your brain entirely, you can allow yourself to experience something transcendent. A thrill at the possibility of release. A sudden longing for liberation. A real chance at exaltation. Maybe, next time you confront the sublime, instead of cosmic horror, you could be feeling cosmic bliss. That's such a fucking good now, Of course, the best way to experiment with this would be to try writing a little bit of it yourself. My yeah. greatest hope is that at the end of these videos, you come away feeling that spark, the desire to make something up. But writing, even at the best of times, is it's a difficult. Really difficult It's fucking hard. Start. It can it's take stupidly years hard. for some authors just to work up the courage to begin. Fortunately, a while back I found something that will absolutely help you. 
It's a 14 part mm -hmm. video series called Create. By the way, at least I have the description down there so you can go and support these motherfuckers. Yeah, please. So, Table Bot is the talent. Um, the Table tail Lloyd's Talents Helpers. Benjamin Cook, writer, director, and voice actor. Nice. Abby Norton, art director, asset artist. Okay. Alex Kuhn, animator and editor. Baz Bartet, audio engineer. Becca Chuntz, researcher and writer. And Carrie W., researcher and writer. Okay. Anyways, everyone, go into the description of this video. I want you to like this motherfucking video as well. And then also just tell them in the comment section, Hey, yo! We love this. This is beautiful. Like, this has been a fucking amazing reaction. Well, it's not been an amazing reaction. It's been an amazing reaction for me because I actually... I was kind of getting bored through stream. Um, this has gotten my brain floating again and asking a lot of questions. I like watching your videos because they really do make me ask questions. Anyways, bye everyone. I'm going to be telling y'all to get down in the description support the original people, okay? Thank you very much. As for myself... You know, the usual like, comments, and subscribes, and also at the same time, the very, very, very bottommost link will be my own link. It's to my subscribe star. It's nothing too special, but it's only $8 a month. Okay. Um, and if anyone ever decides to do so, go ahead. Thank you. Oh, yeah, by the way, for my subscribe star, um, you, you basically get, you, you get, you get access to all the videos as out right after they're made. So you can just be ready. You can get them far before they come onto YouTube, which means you'll probably be around like two, three months ahead of time. Um, there's also the fact that, well, you can kind of just... Oh, there's also one last thing for $8 with the subscribe star. Once a month, you can get one um, fucking just free model for 3D and Blender and shit that I'll just work on and make for you. Yeah, I'll just model some shit for you in 3D for Blender. Um, and yeah, please have a lovely fucking day, and um, goodbye. I hope I was at least somewhat entertained.